Well, good afternoon and welcome to this month's Dean's Research Seminar in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm on today, the Boomerang people, as well as the traditional owners of the lands where you're situated, and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and the waterways of Australia for thousands of years, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today we have Professor Kate, Associate Professor Kate Howell, who will present on discovering, defining, and manipulating microbial communities for better food. A few words about Kate. She earned um, both her Bachelor of Science Honours and her Doctorate from the University of New South Wales. She also holds a Bachelor of Applied Science from Charles Sturt University, based around studies on wine science. After her PhD, Kate undertook postdoctoral studies at the University of Geneva in Switzerland and worked in the wine industry before joining the University of Melbourne in 2008. Kate's areas of expertise and interest include yeast biology, analytical chemistry, microbial ecology, and food production. Her research has been reported in top tier scientific journals and edited books and has attracted 1,200 citations. She has an H index of 24. She's an associate editor of the Journal of Applied Microbiology, Frontiers in Microbiology, and Microbiology Spectrum. Importantly, for science communication, she also publishes in industry journals in the food and wine sector to communicate to a non-scientific, specialized audience. Her work has appeared in Science Now, Cosmos Magazine, and on the ABC Catalyst Show. She's completed eight graduate researchers and currently supervises another seven and chairs five graduate research committees. Kate's had a number of leadership roles here at the University of Melbourne, including as a research integrity advisor and investigator. And in the School of Agriculture and Food, she is the director of research training and a member of the school executive. Please welcome Associate Professor Kate Howell. Kate, over to you. Thank you for the introduction, John. And um, it's a real pleasure to deliver today's uh, Dean's Research Seminar. Um, I'll be presenting work from many people today and I'll name them as I work through the presentation. I'm extremely fortunate to work with such a, a group of collaborators and students. It's really their hard work, questions, enthusiasm and expertise that I'm highlighting today. I'm back on campus, which I love, and I'm finding the company of colleagues, students and lab life really inspiring. I hope we will soon be able to welcome back the missing faces of students who have been unable to return to the country and their studies. Much of the research done in my lab is based on the relationships between humans and food and the microbes that make them. You can see here a plant-based meal shared with beverages such as beer, wine and coffee. Behind the production of many of these foods are microorganisms um, which provide critical functions to develop flavour and aroma, producing nutritionally dense foods. We'll talk about these today and then consider the role that other microbial communities, those in our foods, have in releasing the full potential of these foods and beverages. While most of the work that I will present today has been done in wine and bread ecosystems, it is clear that the microbial activity is really important in a range of foods. For example, the flavour of chocolate and coffee, for example, is dependent on the microbes that ferment the raw bean products. We will consider the production of uh, developed foods or processed foods and um, discuss that in all cultural and culinary traditions, there's ways of eating um, fermented foods. So today's talk will guide you through the discovery of some of the microbes involved in fermentations and consider how they work together um, to produce the foods that we love and enjoy. Along the way, I hope to convince you that ongoing research in this area contributes to the production of safe, healthy and nutritionally dense food for all Australians. So let's start with some definitions. Um, well, we'd like to talk about what fermentation is today. So it's important to find out what this is and what it means to different groups. So fermentation, if you were to speak to a biochemist, means something quite different to a food production person. Um, here today, I'm going to be talking about fermentation as a metabolic activity of microbes. And as they are growing and completing their life cycle, um, they are metabolizing and this produces many different compounds. Um, it often produces ethanol but not always as we'll discuss today and we'll consider fermentation as a way of biotransformation of um, macromolecules and small molecules in a food substrate um, to produce these foods. 
Now, the microbes that are important are fungi, um, importantly yeasts. Um, yeasts are a, a, a budding or unicellular fungi and other bacteria. And I've, I've put here a, a picture produced by a PhD candidate, Nim, who, which shows some of the diversity in quite an artistic format um, for, to illustrate this diversity. My entry into the world of fermentation was through looking at Saccharomyces cerevisiae or the budding yeast that you see pictured here. You can see it's quite a, a beautiful shaped yeast um, with these little bud scars on it um, where the daughter cells bud off from the, mother, the mothers. Um, most of the production of foods and beverages involves Saccharomyces cerevisiae somehow. It's adapted quite well in this generalist kind of sugar-loving environment. Um, and it's interesting that not only is it produced, uh, involved in many of these transformations, it's a really important model for biology. Most of the um, advances in different areas of biology have been done first in yeast. So, for example, um, Saccharomyces was the first microbe to be visualised in a microscope, the first eukaryote to be fully sequenced, and the first microbe to have a really well-developed set of genetic tools to understand cellular function. Um, it is a really important microorganism that sort of sparked my interest in this area. So I'll take you through some of the foods that it is involved in making. When we talk about fermented foods, we can define them in different ways. And this infographic perhaps helps you understand what some of the diversity is. You can consider fermented foods that retain the live microorganisms that made them. And these are things such as um, yogurt, water, kefir, most cheeses, um, plant-based fermentation such as tempeh, kimchi or other fermented vegetables. Some kombuchas, I wouldn't say most kombuchas, and um, some beers as well. And you can contrast this with foods that are fermented and have, um, but have the microbes killed or removed during the processing of these foods. These are things such as bread, such as sourdough bread, where the microbes are kind of on a suicide mission, if you like. Um, they do the fermentation and then are killed as the bread is baked. Um, and you can compare that to heat treatment um, for different sorts of foods here, um, including the production of coffee and chocolate beans, which are roasted um, before fermentation, and wine, where the microbes are essentially removed through filtration in most cases. In the talk today, I'm going to concentrate on plant-based fermentations, um, but I would like to highlight here that there's some really interesting work in our school being done on some of the plant-based fermentations, particularly in the production of yogurt, where Dr. Seneca Ranadira is working in this area, looking at the probiotic potential of yogurt, including a PhD candidate, Natalia Gupta, who is in fact putting two things together. She's looking at the production of plant-based yogurts as, as an alternative. So some really interesting work in that area, but today I'm going to be focusing on plant-based fermentations. So I told you I was interested in yeast and started off working in wine, so let's have a little talk about that further. Without microorganisms, there's no wine. You just have a kind of a rather boring grape juice. And there's two fermentations, two types of fermentations that occur during wine production. The first is an alcoholic fermentation where sugars, mostly glucose, but also fructose, are converted into ethanol with the gas carbon dioxide produced during the fermentation. And of course, ethanol is, is what makes wine wine, isn't it? Um, the yeast involved is primarily Saccharomyces cerevisiae, now our good friend, the fermentative yeast. Now, secondary fermentation that can, can occur in wine fermentation, that's a malolactic fermentation, and that's conducted by lactic acid bacteria, um, primarily Enococcus ingi. Enococcus ingi also produces gas during fermentation um, that converts malic acid into lactic acid, and this has a quite a strong flavour effect. Um, those transformations are really interesting because as these yeasts are converting these major compounds into others, there's also a lot of other transformations going on. And this was the focus of my PhD studies. So here, this is a figure actually that I, I made um, for my PhD. So you can see it looks like it was done in MS Paint, but um, and I haven't updated it since, but never mind, the story is still there. Um, yeast convert sugar to ethanol and they release aromas during fermentation. So I was really interested in this formation of um, the fermentation bouquet or microbial flavour during fermentation and how non-volatile compounds to begin with are, are transformed by yeast into flavoursome compounds. 
Now, if we look a little bit closer into the metabolism of yeast, you can start to see how this might occur. Here we've got production of sugar, um, or sorry, the uptake of sugar and then conversion into ethanol through major um, glycolytic pathways in the yeast. And as this happens, all of these other compounds occur as well. Some of them are, need to occur to balance up some of the cofactors needed to produce ethanol um, and others are considered a secondary metabolism. But in a wine environment, and in many other food fermentations, these small molecules that are produced are also flavour compounds. So you can see that, flat, that fermentation um, really starts to impact the aroma and flavour. One of the first side of my PhD was actually looking at how um, aroma and flavour compounds of a particular variety were enhanced, including this passion fruit aroma, which was released um, from a non-volatile precursor. So... As winemakers understood that this glycolytic flux into ethanol was a really good way to um, assure that your wine fermentation would occur really quickly and easily and you would have defined flavours, it was realised that um, you could add those yeasts into the wine deliberately. And so the, the, um, the production of inoculated fermentations become, became the norm in the wine industry. However, there were still some winemakers that were absolutely certain that wines made without inoculated yeast tended to taste better. They were riskier. Sometimes they didn't finish the fermentation, but they tended to have more complex and attractive aromas and flavours in them. And so I was tasked with finding out some of the reasons were why that occurred. Um, and what was noted by my PhD advisor, the late and great grain fleet was that in the initial stages of fermentation um, where the great must or the great juice starts to ferment, there's a big population of non-saccharomyces yeast which are present um, and they tend to die off early into the fermentation, leaving Saccharomyces cerevisiae, our principal yeast, to conduct the fermentation. Now, we... We hypothesised that the yeast here that grow and reproduce but then die were affecting somehow um, moderating, changing or altering the metabolism of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, in a way that we couldn't predict otherwise. And so we decided to do some experiments to find out what was happening here. What we ended up concluding was that yeast share metabolites and interact during growth. So yeast growing in isolation produce different metabolites than when grown in mixed culture. And we did this by um, me in the lab making small batches of wine uh, made by inoculating single strains of, of yeasts and then comparing that um, to a wine made with when I inoculated three different yeasts together and then comparing that to the blend. And when we looked at those together, it was clear that the wines made with a blended made from blended monocultures was quite different to the mixed culture, and keeping, of course, in mind that the compounds produced during these fermentations affect flavour. So these volatile compounds that we measured were, in fact, showing that yeast were interacting during fermentation. So what are these interactions and how can we measure them? Well, some work uh, we started with uh, Nils Arnborg from the University of Copenhagen. We started um, investigating the literature uh, around community-based signalling behaviour in other species of yeast. And this is really important in the medical yeast, for example, example Canada albicans, where production of these density, uh, community density-dependent signalling molecules makes a switch between a non-pathogenic form and a pathogenic form. And there was a lot of talk about whether Saccharomyces cerevisiae or other um, non-Saccharomyces yeast involved in the wine fermentation would also have this effect. Really interestingly, those compounds have an aroma, um, a really attractive aroma compounds themselves. So it was like if they were interacting, that was making the wine taste better. So here we inoculated some of these putative signalling compounds into the media, um, solid media, and we were looking for differences between um, uh, the morphology of the cells in, as they were growing um, without these compounds and with these compounds. And you can see in some cases you, that the, um, the colonies start to get all having little finger-like protrusions come out, and that's an indication of filamentous growth. 
This work has been continued by PhD candidate Michaela Winters um, with Niels Armborg at the University of Copenhagen. And Michaela's designed some really nice experiments to investigate the mechanisms of microbial chat or the ways that the yeast interact with one another in a fermentation. So intercellular communication may allow individual cells to assess the population's density and coordinate behaviour by secreting these small, aromatic, delicious molecules into the environment. And so Michaela is interested in, uh, in understanding this switch between planktonic growth, where you have the, the budding cells there, into the filamentous growth and understanding where this critical threshold is reached, where the density and the concentration of the signaling molecule interact together. So Michaela is looking at mothers and daughters and their budding patterns. So here she follows uh, a single cell as it grows and divides over hours and she monitors the direction of the budding of each um, daughter cell off the mother. So here for example you have the, the mother cell, its daughter buds off and then she measures which side either opposite or adjacent to the original bud site that that granddaughter, if you like, starts to be budded from. And as she collates this data, she realises that this, um, if, if it's continually budding on the opposite side, you're moving towards filamentous growth. She's looking at, at um, the timeframes of when these switches happen and comparing it to the production of molecules which, uh, which could be involved in the signaling. And so this is an emerging story that's um, close to publication. So hopefully we'll be able to share more of it soon. So I hope we've been able to convince you here that um, yeast communicating with one another are able to change the flavour of wine, and they're doing this in very specific ways. But let's go back to uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and fermentation and consider the other Saccharomyces yeast, non-Saccharomyces yeast, which are present. Uh, Echo Liu, or D. Liu, um, as a PhD student, she's now Dr. Liu, she graduated last year, um, was interested in Saccharomyces cerevisiae as the main driver of fermentation in the wine environment. And so Echo was collecting grapes and their attended soil samples um, and following the flavour and microbial development through to the production of wine. And I just want you to focus on um, part C here, where she shows um, through monitoring the DNA um, abundance, relative DNA abundance of fungal um, partners in those parts of the fermentation, that the relative abundance of different strains um, changes between the beginning, middle and end of fermentation. And you can see here with the red bars, that Saccharomyces cerevisiae starts to dominate. Um, at the end of fermentation, there's very little there, and that's sort of what we would expect based on, on Graham's results. Um, she was interested in what the impact of the non-Saccharomyces yeast and the other fungi present in the start of the fermentation had. So she went back to look at um, the flavour of wine at the end to see if it was having an impact. So here she... Um, measured 88 different compounds in total and 48 of them um, were able to separate wines based on all of these different grape growing regions in Victoria based on their aroma. So here she's able to show that the flavour of wine follows a regional pattern and you can see in particular that the Macedon Ranger sticks out quite a lot in this analysis. You'll remember that not only did she measure the aroma of wine, but she was also looking at microbial diversity all the way through the wine um, production system and including the soil before the grapes um, were harvested. And she managed to balance up the contribution of all of these different um, fungal diversity patterns to relate them to wine regionality. And she found that the fungal diversity um, in the must, so the grape juice, if you like, was the strongest predictor of wine regionality, meaning that that group of um, non-saccharomyces fungi that are present at the start of fermentation are really imprinting the wine regionality characteristics on that eventual wine. She measured many other drivers to modify wine regionality as well, but fungi um, in the must is a, is a strong one. You can see the, and that's indicated by the, the stronger arrow here to impact upon wine aroma. And importantly, that the soil fungal diversity either 
um, direct, directly or indirectly affects the wine aroma through many means. And you can see that there's other links between climate and soil property that I think there. So Echo's work was really exciting because it showed the really important role of fungal, soil fungal diversity on the expression of wine regional um, aroma and flavour, whereas previously we'd really only understood um, bacterial um, contributions. So here we can summarise that microbial distribution in the environment affects wine flavour. Um, microbial variability can be seen in other wine regions, and particularly New Zealand and California and now Australia. While soil bacteria can be linked to wine aroma by the region or the area, um, undergoing this second fermentation tends to, to balance out that effect. And that could just be because um, uh, often malolactic fermentation or that secondary fermentation is initiated by an added strain of Enococcus eni rather than the indigenous microflora. And so the soil becomes a really important part of understanding what's, what um, grapevine quality is either by direct effects, by contributing to the, to the grape microbiota or indirectly by affecting plant physiology and grape composition. So here I wanted to link into a slightly different story considering the place where the grapes or the crop is grown and the microbial distribution um, in the fermented food. Um, and this is extremely important because um, some information, again, in Saccharomyces has shown that um, you can figure out the origin of a yeast strain based on its genetics and you can follow that through a crop through um, the geographic regions around the world. So here um, researchers have isolated and sequenced Saccharomyces cerevisiae from many different grape growing regions and, and environments around the world and they've realised that the origin of modern Saccharomyces is China um, and it was and it started to inhabit the Mediterranean oak environment, grows on oak trees in the bark in Europe. At some point, um, these yeasts were able to transplant themselves into the grape e ecosystem. Um, and once in the grape, grape ecosystem, were transported along with um, the grapes to many different parts of the world as, as agriculture spread, as grapevines started to be planted elsewhere. So Saccharomyces cerevisia has followed humans and their crops around, which is really interesting. And, and even more than that now, we can see that this extends to the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are present in cocoa and coffee bean fermentations as well, where um, perhaps the introduction of Saccharomyces into the Americas in started to colonise the fermentations of coffee and, and chocolate, um, which was then spread around the world as these crops were as well. So people carry microbes with them. Sometimes they might do that on purpose, um, like in wine or beer starters, or perhaps sometimes by accident as they cling to crops, maybe in soil or in food processing equipment. Um, and this has happened um, in many different environments. Now, I'm really interested in this area because um, Australia is a country that has imported most of its agriculture from overseas. In fact, all of the modern agriculture in Australia is from crops that have previously grown elsewhere. And so my question would be, well, what, um, what microbes are associated with, say, wheat or barley or some of the other big cereal crops that we have? And how can we um, track that through, uh, through the grain and into the breads or beer or other grain products that we'd enjoy? So I'm going to switch now to a discussion on Australian bread. Um, while most of modern agriculture has been imported to Australia, it was implanted in a system where there was a vibrant and productive food um, system by Australia's original inhabitants, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And there's a lot of evidence that this occurred, both through the archaeological record, through settler diaries, and through um, stories and lived knowledge that exists today. So, for example, there's a, a large grinding stone, I've taken a picture from the Australian Museum website, that was used to, to mill grains of cereal crops that were collected. And these have been isolated, have been found and um, collected or exist still in the grain belt across Australia. Now, these 
um, the, the, the making of bread or cereal products used vastly different crops to the wheat and barley that come from um, Western agriculture and include things such as panicum or native millet, panicum decompositum, um, themida, also known as, as kangaroo grass, if you like. It's got quite a, a long seed, although the seeds are very small at the end. It's got a long horn on the end, which needs to be removed. And sometimes through the grinding of um, rhizomes in water-based plants, such as this typha species or kambangi. And so we've really got um, a lot of opportunities to learn from, highlight, and champion the production of Australian made bread. Now this has been done um, with uh, Black Duck Foods and Professor Bruce Pascoe, um, who's a member of our faculty at the university, um, where kangaroo grass in this photo has been incorporated into bread um, as a part of a, a social and um, economic revitalization of Aboriginal culture and food cultures that we see nowadays. And we've been doing some of it at the uni as well. For example, honor student Sam Hudson made some bread made out of panic and flour um, during his project in 2019. And we also have an opportunity to start investigating breads um, which have been, I guess, preserved in museum collections around Australia and investigating the, the plants that we use to make them and also the role of leavening agents. Um, in my case, I'm particularly interested in microbes um, that allowed that to happen. So back to those limiting agents, back to those microbes. I'd like to go back to the, to the model um, of the microbial community making, making food and extend this model to include more of the bacteria. And a really good way to do this is by considering bread or sourdough bread as we're calling it. So sourdough starters have a really interesting um, community composition of, of almost always containing a yeast or a lactic acid bacteria if they're allowed to start spontaneously and are maintained. Now, this um, co-culture, if you like, is maintained by the baker or the person in the kitchen cooking by routine subculture of the starter um, to maintain this active starter. And the leavened dough, um, which we know is produced through fermentation, is um, it rises because of the production of carbon dioxide. I was fortunate enough to go on a sabbatical in France and um, the people in the lab next door were isolating all sorts of yeast from the, um, the sourdough starters that they were looking at in France. And so I thought this could be something really interesting to look at in Australia. Um, so what are some of these interesting yeasts? Well, um, uh, you can see on this donut figure here, abundance of, of the named species that have come out of sourdough and mostly Saccharomyces, that's the, the broad blue region there. Um, but this greeny section here is from yeasts such as Kazakhstania and some of the Kazakhstania isolates here have only been isolated in a sourdough environment, which makes them quite an interesting um, area to investigate. Now, the bacteria involved um, are mostly lactic acid bacteria um, and they've all been renamed. So if you don't recognise any of those names, don't worry, it's not you, it's the naming system. Um, and you might recognise such um, species as Fructilactobacillus san francisensis, which is um, a sourdough uh, a bacteria, um, a heterofermentative bacteria, which is often isolated from uh, grain fermentations. So what exists in Australian sourdough is I hear you ask over the webinar. Well, uh, we had a look at that. We, we're ongoing, uh, ongoing collaborations with different bakers around Australia. Um, and we've, ch we've chosen these bakers um, to work with these bakers because of their deep passion for their, for their craft, but also because they tend not to use um, cultured Saccharomyces cerevisiae in their bakery. So we assume that their bakery would contain just the yeast and the bacteria that um, have been cultivated through the sourdough fermentation. You might recognise some faces here, Michael James on the Tivoli Road Bakery, Philippa, um, Stephen Noonan, a, a, an ongoing collaborator mixing up his starter by hand there, which is always interesting to watch. And so work done by Anna Whitworth as part of her honours project has shown that many of the species that we find here are also found overseas. So this really gives... Um, credence the idea that we're, we're working with the same species um, perhaps exist worldwide and we haven't sequenced the Saccharomyces to know if they are related to any other populations um, but that's certainly a possibility. So we have the Kazakhstania yeast, we have the Fructolactobacillus san francisensis. 
Anna went on to find out um, in all these starters that we're looking at um, which yeast and bacteria grew with other yeast and bacteria. And so she started looking at the combinations that were found. Um, in some places, in some starters, you can see that Saccharomyces and Kazakhstani humulus grow together. That's great. In some cases, they have just one, um, one isolate, sometimes two. And I particularly like that um, this starter here has two yeasts and two bacteria which um, are active in the fermentation. And that's because that's my own sourdough starter, the starter NRK. Um, you can hear its origin story on a bite-sized lecture, which is available on the university YouTube page. Um, this starter makes some delicious bread. And I guess one of the great things about um, this area is that you get to do some experiment at home in the kitchen yourself. Anna went on to ask some questions about the persistence and the stability of these microbial fermentations over time. And so here she was putting back these yeasts and bacteria in defined populations and culturing them in the lab to see if they um, could persist or not. In, in this case, in the first one here, you can see that after 14 days of culture, um, that the Saccharomyces cerevisiae tended to dominate and there was only a little bit of, uh, of the Kazakhstani humulus in comparison, but this tended to stabilise after 28 days of culture. When she added in the bacteria, though, it was unable to be implanted into the population of any of these sourdoughs which is really interesting in this, um, the, the topic, one of the topics of her current PhD project. She does know that um, the timeframes that we've looked at here are much longer timeframes than previous scientific studies, although not in the context of a, um, a sourdough starter, many of which have, have gone on for hundreds of years, um, and that these interactions are not regulated by bacteria sensitivity or, or biofilm interactions. So what else could be going on here? Well, we know, um, similar to the wine situation, that these interactions of the yeast and bacteria could follow similar things. The yeast are producing um, carbon dioxide, ethanol, and all sorts of aroma compounds through the um, production of, uh, through the, the breakdown of carbohydrates. But an interesting study, which has been published in Cell Systems in 2017, showed that in a water kefir interaction, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and the lactic acid bacteria that grow, grow with it have formed a really nice um, uh, relationship of mutual benefit. Yeasts tend to um, overproduce amino acids and and whatever they don't need, they secrete into the media. But lactic acid bacteria tend to be quite fastidious about their nitrogen requirements, and so they'd take those up. In return, the lactic acid bacteria were breaking down carbohydrates to make them more available to the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we're wondering if something like that is occurring also in sourdough. We've gone on, though, to see what the effects of bacteria inclusion are in fermentations, regardless of its longevity. And to do this, we're using small-scale baking, um, using defined mixed cultures. And you can see here a picture of Daphne and Michaela baking away in the lab to make these sweet little loaves, which we showed to sensory panels, um, as well as eat a little bit ourselves, to be honest. Here we're using defined mixed cultures. So we're using that, we're, we're putting back yeast and bacteria in defined combinations. You can see here there's yeast only in the yellow and green, and then um, one of the yeasts with different combinations of bacteria. We bake the bread, we investigate the aroma, and we can see that they're quite different. You can see that the two yeasted breads here, um, the aroma compounds that are present in the bread are quite distinct from those with the mixed cultures. So bacteria make a big difference. And we can tell what that difference is by when the results of when we look at it um, or we ask a sensory panel to look at it, where the yeasted breads have different, um, different profiles than the other breads. So I hope I've given you a, a bit of a glance into the interkingdom communications and, and interactions in a sourdough starter. Um, now I'd like to consider a few other things of how microbial activity contributes to fermented foods and highlight some of the research going on in the lab. Master's student Meng is looking at the production of tempeh, which is a fungal fermentation of soybeans. Um, and when bacteria, he, said, he suspects particularly, um, particular bacteria are included, you can start to produce vitamin B12 in tempeh 
And this is a really important thing to do as it increases the nutritional density of this food. But vitamin B12 tends to be deficient for people who follow a plant-based only diet. So this is a really exciting area. Looking forward to seeing all of the results. Um, talented Master of Science student Rusha Patil, along with her supervisor, Alex Johnson from Biosciences, are interested in iron availability. And Rusha has is doing a series of experiments where she's looking to see if um, individual yeasts and bacteria and in their combinations are able to break down phytic acid uh, by the production of specific enzymes to make iron available. This is a really important area because um, lack of iron or uh, anemia that it causes is, is a pervasive problem. We have other people working on whether fermentation in, in breads um, using a sourdough strategy can decrease FODMAPs. This is as uh, particular carbohydrate structures, which um, some people are quite sensitive to. Um, Julia Steenkamp is part of a PhD study is looking to see if lactic acid fermentation can, lactic, uh, can reduce residues of organophosphates in grains. And a team of people, including Min City and Emma, are looking to see if um, fermented foods can be considered probiotic, particularly focused on kombucha and water kefirs. We're quite sure that the microbes define fermented food quality um, and texture and the structure of bread is linked to the fermentation strategy as Mark's showing in his project. Um, Maria's excellent work on coffee fermentation is being linked to flavour and quality scores and this follows on from the work that Xavier is using, um, the strategies that Xavier has done um, to measure uh, quality of wine from the aroma profiles, which, as we know, come from um, microbial activity. Now, we've talked about quality quite a lot, but there are many other small molecules in food that contribute to health, and one of these areas are polyphenols. Now, polyphenols are a really chemically diverse group of compounds. They tend to be concentrated in uh, fruits and vegetables and other and grains, for example, um, and are associated with colour sometimes. Now, work done by Sel Sophie Selby Pham, now Dr Selby Pham, as part of her PhD, showed that the um, uptake of these polyphenols in our bodies can be related to the food matrix in which they're um, put in and, and related to the molecular weight. And because these polyphenols have a positive effect on the oxidant state of our bodies, this is turning out to be a really useful tool. We can't just um, increase the uptake by making foods liquid because there's other things going on as Jennifer Gu discovered, now Dr Gu discovered in her PhD studies where she was looking at the interaction of polyphenols and, and fibre by comparing um, the uptake into the gut microbiota of intact cells and ruptured cells. And this work has been continued by Tao as he considers in particular, I know that's a very busy slide, the interplay between polyphenols and dietary fibre and microbial activity. I'm nearly finished. Um, I just want to highlight one last topic, which has been worked on by both Xavier and Jin Wei as part of um, their, pro their PhD projects to look at the variability, individual var variability in oral proteome and microbiome to determine food preference. Now, here we had a, a team of willing um, wine experts who were tasting wine, but we're also sampling the saliva. And in their saliva, we we're measuring um, the proteome, so the proteins that are present in saliva, but also the microbial abundance um, to see whether we can link that to um, food preference, particular wine preference. And Jinwei is going on to look at this across a wide range of consumer groups, um, uh, either based on country or based on other attributes. So we'll finish off just by considering whether we should be consuming fermented foods. Um, it depends on the type. Um, anything that increases your intake of vegetables um, is a good thing to do, and I should always say go easy on anything containing alcohol. Dietary evidence that we could use um, is emerging but needs more support. So there's really good evidence for yogurt as a carrier of probiotics and the health benefits of that. Um, but the area of fermented botanicals and the evidence that supports this is emerging and it's likely that small molecules are important and we're a long way yet for being able to suggest a daily intake of microbes.
So with microbes in foods, um, I hope you've been able to see today that they can dramatically transform the raw products into culturally appropriate foods, increase nutritional density and sometime intoxications with the production of alcohol, and come from ingredients in the environment in which they're grown. And they affect humans differently, both the preference and the effect on human health. Um, so we'll finish off this meal. I was thinking that would be nice to have a, a group meeting with a, a meal like that. Maybe that could be something we could aim for as we all come back to campus. But with that, I'd just like to acknowledge a team of immensely talented and hardworking students, now former students and colleagues, including Sophie, um, Echo, Jennifer, soon to be Dr. Wendy Cameron, uh, Xavier, Michaela, Min, Mariam, Billy, Jin Wei, Tao, Yipeng and Anna. Um, a group of master's students have joined the lab and they're just um, great fun to be working with. We're getting a lot out of our conversations and students such as Rusha, Siti, Mark, Meng, Maria and Emma. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the University of Melbourne collaborators such as Professor Bruce Pascoe, Professor Rudy Appels, Panj, Hafitz, um, a newly emerging collaboration with Rachel Carey, Alex Johnson from Biosciences, and colleagues such as Julia, Deli, and Frank. Um, other collaborators around the world, but in particular um, Nils and Delphine, and really the enthusiastic group of bakers, wineries, food companies, and community groups that are always ready for a chat about fermented foods and have been a great support of our work. So thank you very much. Kate, um, Kate, thank you so much for that. Um, I really enjoyed that and um, admire your ability to tell it to us in a way that uh, uh, engages the non-specialists amongst us that uh, don't know too much about this particular subject. Um, can I remind everybody to put their questions in the Q&A, please, and uh, we'll come to them. I see a couple, but I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and just ask you a question at the beginning. Um, so um, if we think about Australia and the animals in Australia, we have uh, particular kinds of animals in Australia. For example, uh, marsupials uh, developed in Australia. If I think about viruses, which I know quite a lot about, um, they, they got distributed around the world by humans and animal species and things. Now, what about these fungi? I mean, um, and, and yeast. Do we have a very unique... Um, you showed us some nice diagrams uh, uh, about the, the types of fungi that were present in, in your uh, sourdough starters. But does Australia have a totally unique um, uh, flora, if that's the right word, of yeast? Um, it's a, it's a great question, John, and I'd love to know the answer to that. I think um, we know a lot about, say, yeast and bacteria when we choose to look for it. Um, the yep. microscopic organisms and some of them require like quite specific growth characteristics to be able to get them. For example, if you were to go out even in a European forest looking for Saccharomyces and, and culturing it in our traditional ways, you wouldn't necessarily find it. It needs to be made by an enrichment culture um, to also knock out other things. So because it is so economically useful, people have done that work. Um, but it doesn't tend to happen um, with other genera that we that could well be economically important. We just don't know about them yet. So we don't have a very good handle on that. Um, but it's something that I'm increasingly thinking about because I think there's uh, a real potential for biodiscovery. I think there's a potential to be using Australia's natural resources along with the, the peoples who cultivated those over so many times, the traditional owner groups and community groups, to be able to, um, to use these to, to you know, ensure a food supply and make really distinctive but um, healthy foods. You know? So we don't have much work on it. And every time I look at those maps, I think, ah, oh, nothing's been done in Australia. You know, we've got such a unique environment, um, animals, yep. as we say, but also plants and the interactions between them. Um, so it's, it's really hard to know, to be honest. Because, um, you, you know, just following on from that, um, you, you told us a nice story about uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which probably came from oak trees in China and then colonised the um, uh, grapes, and then it spread around the world with um, uh, grape culture. And in fact, most of the uh, most of the yeast that are in the fermentation in the wines in Victoria seem to be um, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But yes, if you sort of give somebody like Jancis Robinson a wine tasting, she says, "Oh, this is an Australian wine." Well, this is a wine from California, you know, and yet the majority of it has been has been fermented by the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So some of it could be coming from these native yeasts. I guess that was one of your points, wasn't it? Absolutely, I think so. And look, I'm. 
I'm a microbiologist, so I think, you know, microbiologists are the base of everything, but I'm not so naive to think that that's the only thing that contributes. You know, the Australian environment produces a lot of other things as well, and our traditions of winemaking are, are quite distinctive as well. So I think, you know, a wine professional is picking up on all of those cues, not just the fermentation bouquet as subset of the aroma. Um, the slide that I made in, you know, in, in this paint back in the day, you know, really enhances the microbial um, component of wine aroma to be able to provide those signals. But, you know, emerging work in the lab, particularly Xavier's work, shows that, you know, you can pretty much predict a wine's quality based on the aroma compounds that you pick up in the grape before microbes are directly involved okay. in the fermentation anyway. So um, right. a bit of a question there, I think. All right. Thanks, Kate. Let's turn to our uh, colleagues. And the first question... Uh, and we can, you can ask these questions live when you unmute. So the first question I've got is from uh, Namani Wickramasinghe. And uh, Namani, would you like to ask your question? Are you there or shall I ask? Uh, Namani? Okay, let me ask it. Um, so, um, Kate, the question is, can probiotics be added to fermented food to enhance the quality and the shelf life? It's a really interesting question, Namani, and one that I don't think we've answered very well. Um, I've been thinking about this a little bit with the production of water kefir and kombucha, which are all marketed as being probiotic. Um, but I know because of the way fermentation works that if you've got active ingredients in there, um, and live microbes and live bacteria to fit the definition of, of probiotics, you're going to be reducing the shelf life. Now, City's looking at this in the lab because she's like, well, how can you have an eight-month shelf life on something that has live microbes in it? And I think what's happening is that the food companies are reducing the fermentative bacteria um, which have produced the, the, the kombucha or the water kefir and they're adding back um, probiotics. So... In that way, if we consider that quality is about health benefits, yes, maybe that would do it. Um, I think the balance, of course, is with um, with the shelf life, as, of course, as well. But we can do clever things about that by using non-sugar sweeteners, for example, that um, the yeast and the bacteria just can't use to be able to ferment any further, so to make a, a relatively stable product. But I think it's a really interesting question. Thanks for money. Thanks for that question. Thanks for the answer, Kate. Um, okay, now to a real, um, not that you're not, but uh, to another real wine expert, uh, Wendy Cameron. <laughs> Wendy, um, would, would you like to uh, ask your question? Uh, thanks, Kate. Thanks for um, a great presentation. But I guess what I was just wondering, that diversity of the microbes and the yeast, um, do you, how do you think that might be related to the actual gut microbiome diversity and therefore health and the incidence of some of these inflammatory bowel diseases and things that seem to be increasing in the Western world? Yeah, a great question, Wendy, and I'd love to know the answer to it as well. <laughs> um, what we're beginning to understand from the literature is that consumption of fermented foods that contain live microorganisms can impact the diversity of the gut microbiota. So you can pick them up in the gut microbiota and they tend and they, they seem to be able to um, be sustained there. So we can certainly change um, the gut microbiota by the way we eat. And that's not only by ingesting the live microbes, but also by having uh, a really diverse diet with lots of different sorts of foods in it, including a diversity of, um, of uh, dietary fibre and that's really important to, to cultivate a really strong diversity. It seems that it comes down to diversity in this exactly. Yeah. So low diversity seems to be associated with overgrowth of problematic species and like correlates with all sorts of um, unpleasant things. So I think having a diverse diet with plenty of different sorts of foods, whether I think fermented foods could be considered a, an appropriate dietary intervention um, to overcome those things. I'm not quite sure the evidence is there yet, but um, Min Chan in the, in, the, in the research group has really convinced that this is a, an area that's worth studying and is, is conducting literature and surveys to be able to support that to potentially go into a clinical trial. 
Um, it's clear that inflammatory bowel disease and, you know, problems with Clostridium difficile and those sorts of things can be um, mediated in some patients some of the time by altering the gut microbiota, um, but that's sort of getting a little bit out of my area. Yes. There's certainly correlations, which are interesting. Thanks, Wendy. Yes, thanks. And our next question then is from uh, Chiara Murgia. Um, Chiara, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I'm on. Uh, thanks, Kate. Very interesting and also for us, not really <clears throat> into the um, area. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you, you talk about the complexity and I was very fascinated by the um, uh, diversity of the bread starters in the in Saudo. Um, and uh, I was wondering whether uh, you need you can capture uh, you need like meta metagenomic technologies to really capture the um, diversity and the complexity of different um, starters and to um, really put um, light on some specificity in, in the Australian uh, environment. Has this been done um, or it's uh, something that um, is undergoing or if it's been done, do you know any results that um, yeah. any of the outcome? Yeah, Chiara, it's a really interesting question. Like the technology is a, a leaping ahead um, and I think we don't know enough about what Australia's natural biodiversity is to be able to, to make some strong predictions. On the technology side, though, um, you know, we, we rely so much when we're thinking about diversity on these barcoding regions. And I know from my work in yeast that that's actually a really bad way to look at yeast diversity um, because they don't tend to be variable at the targeting regions in a way that other, like the broader fungi are. Um, so in a working group with INRA, um, led by Delphine Sicard, we were looking at using different markers to be able to improve the sequencing technology so we could understand at least yeast diversity a little bit better amongst the fungi. Um, so I would say in a way the, the tools are there, um, but no, it hasn't been done in a comprehensive way. Um, but thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from um, Delhi Chen. Delhi, would you like to ask your question? Yes, yes, Kate, very good talk. And uh, Kate, uh, you know, my wine, you know, the, what, uh, uh, how important the microbiomes plays in the, uh, like, within the ranch, you know, is there is any potential when they, we can manipulate the microbiome to make an Australian pinot? <laughs> well, Delhi, I'm going to have to challenge you on the um, on, on the premise of that question because I would say that Australia makes um, better quality uh, Pinot than Burgundy, but we can okay. argue about that over a glass of wine in University House someday because I know it'll be hard to convince you on that fact. Well, um, the banana test will be the best, best way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That'll be fun. Let's invite everyone. Um, so I think... Well, you know, microbiomes and the soil microbiome and how it interacts with the grapevine is just sort of one snapshot of what is affecting quality. And, and you would know just as well as I that terroir, or this idea of um, a flavour coming from the place where a plant is grown and goes into the food is, is a really difficult thing to uncover. So there's um, there's all sorts of things. There's the climate, there's the mesoclimate, the microclimate, there's the microbiome, the microorganisms, the the types of grapes that are there and the the cult, the um yeah the, the the varieties of those particular uh that, that have been planted and cultivated over time, the way that the vines are managed and all of those things all contribute to the flavour. So I don't think we would be able to get to the place where we would say we would be able to make a burgundy wine, but we'd be able to make the best quality Pinot wine that we can in an Australian environment by a better um, understanding of the different factors that we have. And I, I think that there's something really clear here, and I know that you work in very interested in this area as well, Delhi, um, about being able to ensure soil diversity and microbial species, but also good quality soils to be able to support plant growth to get the best quality grapes that we can out. And I personally think that's really where the challenges are. And I know the wine industry is interested in that area too. Thanks for the question, Delhi. Thank you. Uh, thanks to both of you. Now, um, we're coming to the end of the time here. Uh, if anybody wants to put any more questions in, they can go in the Q&A, but there's a couple of uh, comments that have come into the chat, so um, I'll go to those as well. 
but um, the right place for them is the Q&A. Um, Kate, I was going to ask you about this promise that we can feed the world through fermentation. We hear a lot about that recently. You know, uh, in the future, lots of our food are, is going to be form- fermented food, and uh, this will feed the world and, and um, resolve the world food security um, crisis. So uh, Zong Xiang Fang has asked, what's the most challenging issue in food fermentation research? Um, so kind of, you know, would you like to sort of say a few things about what do you think of the future of fermentation is feeding the world and what are the most, what's the most challenging issue? Yeah, I, th- I think it's a really, um, a really good question to, to talk about, Chung Chang. I think that there's, um, we're limited by our imagination and because we're only limited by our imagination because the possibility, like the metabolic diversity that exists in bacteria and yeast, we only just... Um, you know, scratching the surface of understanding. So basically you have a, a you know, a, a transformation problem. There's a bacteria that's generally bacteria, sometimes these have sorted it out beforehand. And what I guess I'm proposing is that if we can use intelligent design, perhaps of um, fermentation systems, we can put together, you know, yeast and bacteria with specific um, mechanisms that they can interact with one another, that they can help one another in a, in a symbiosis to be able to, to transform things that we've never thought we could do before. There's always GM technologies to do that, but I don't think we need to do that in this way because we have already the, the microbial diversity there to just to, to gather. So I don't think that that's the challenge. I think what the challenge might be is um, twofold. There's a sort of a technological challenge of understanding what the um, the composition is and how that contributes to health. I think we know we can feed the world. Like the the world is some of the world's being fed extremely well on bad food, and the other and other parts of the world there's not enough good food to go around and so there's an equity issue there and I, I, I certainly don't think that fermentation can solve that um, but it does help us concentrate on what we imagine good food to be and how we might be able to cultivate systems to enable that to happen. There is an emerging body of, of criticism that fermentation, you know, people working in fermentation, such as myself, is sort of taking um, cultural traditions and, and exploiting them, whereas really maybe that knowledge should, be, should be, belong to the people who develop those technologies over time. And that's evident in the Aboriginal um, Torres Strait Islander research, but also in other um, fermented food traditions around the world. So I think that there's a a social dimension to that that's a bit of a challenge too. You know, I, I think that, you know, performing fermentations to have delicious um, nutritious satisfying alternatives to meat is probably one of the big challenges um, but you know it's a challenge that microbes can solve so I have no no real problems with that um, it's just a matter of finding the will and the um, I guess the funding to get the fundamental research out there to allow that to happen okay thank you Kate that's probably a good um, a good point to, at which to end and uh, uh, thank you for the starter on uh, how fermentation works and all its uses and the science of it and what you and your group and your colleagues are doing um, absolutely fascinating um, so Kate thank you very much thank you John. Um, now uh, in thanking uh, Kate I'd like to thank everybody also for their uh, taking the time to attend today's presentation and I hope you can join us next month which um, will be on the 17th of August for the next Dean's Research Seminar which will be on the effects of human interactions on domesticated animals positive or negative effects and it'll be presented by Professor Paul Hemsworth of Melbourne Veterinary School and I hope you can um, join me then. Thank you and that's it for today.